The Money Cafe is proudly brought to you by InvestSmart's professionally managed accounts. Diversified portfolios of ETFs with a capped fee. T's and C's apply. Find out more at investsmart.com.au. Hello, I'm Alan Cole, founder of Eureka Report, finance presenter on ABC News and columnist for the New Daily. And I'm Stephen Main, contributor at Intelligent Investor, founder of Crikey Shareholder Advocate and City of Manningham Councillor. And I'm James Thompson, senior Chanticleer columnist at the Australian Financial Review. And, and we, we are, are the, the Money, Money Cafe. Cafe, all together for our <laughs> last... The three of us. Our last Money Cafe in the cafe uh, for the year. At eight o'clock in the morning... For James gentlemen. Thompson because of his very heavy work schedule. Well, this is the best part of the day, Stephen. Yeah. Oh, I used to get to sleep in before catching up with Alan. Oh, but, uh, sorry. I was here. I was as I walked in. I was opening up at the same time as the chemist warehouse over the road That's at eight good. o'clock in the morning. A bit of serendipity. Speaking of chemist warehouse, <laughs> well, <laughs> let's talk about that. It was an amazing. Uh, it's an amazing deal. Uh, I think it's easily the biggest reverse takeover we've seen on the uh, exchange in that um, a tiny company, Sigma, or relatively tiny, 800 million bucks, is going to take over a uh, giant in Chemist Warehouse, which is worth something like $8 billion. Um, Basically, Sigma is going to dilute its shareholders by issuing a hell of a lot of shares to Chemist Warehouse founders, and Chemist Warehouse will become a listed company. And it was a Amazing! It was an amazing first ten minutes of the investor call where we had Mario Verrocchi <laughs> and Damien Gantz talking about this business that's been secret for forty years. So, what's years. Damien's relationship with Jack and Sam? Uh, he's son of Jack. Son of Jack. Right. Yeah. Okay. And first ever Chemist Warehouse franchisee back in two thousand. Because they got lots of family members who just be the franchisees, family and friends together. Ra- to get around that one of the five that- pharmacy limit in every state. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. I-, I think it's interesting that um, they had their first Chemist Warehouse. Franchise in two thousand. Yeah, twenty eight years after they went, in, they opened their first chemist. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't move fast. Well, they didn't really get. I mean, this is this is an interesting part of the history. They, for the first, oh, I think until it wasn't until nineteen ninety seven. So they opened their first shop in Reservoir in seventy two. It's not till ninety seven that they sort of strike out on their own. They broke away from the, the Amcal. Amcal pharmacy owned mutual. Unlisted as it was, rebadged thirty stores in a matter of weeks. As my chemist, my chemist, and then um, so did they invent the term the the, the brand my chemist? Yes, I believe yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. But then they did like effectively. They just they said we're going our own, and they started off with my chemist, and then they went with Chemist Warehouse, uh, and then that just took off. As yeah, the, as the, the, the sort of the Bunnings brand, and then it, I think the most amazing thing about it is just the scale and speed of the store rollout. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, to start right. to start from nothing in 2000, and to be finished up with the bunnings of, camp of you know of retail uh, warehouses, and to be worth eight billion dollars, it's just incredible. Yeah, and I thought the interesting thing, obviously, the great fear of the pharmacy guild in this country has been the supermarkets getting into uh, pharmacy industry. Mario said yesterday, our our model was the supermarkets. We wanted to be like a supermarket, but do the pharmacy. And and so it's sort of the, the reverse of what the and, – yeah. and the Pharmacy Guild and Chemist Warehouse do not get on, let's make that clear. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's a fascinating way they've built Yeah, and stuff. I was interested in the fact that the that 70% of their sales come from the non-pharmacy stuff, yeah. which is the reverse of most chemists. Correct. Um, most chemists are 30% up the front with, the, you know, perfumes and yeah. stuff like that. Whereas they're seventy percent. Yep, and if you go into a shop, that yeah, what you see is what you get, right? There's aisles and aisles of hair products and yeah, yeah. you know all sorts of stuff. Yeah, non dispensing, non dispensing. So, yeah. But I thought Fels, Alan Fells was interesting last night on TV talking about he thinks this will bring greater pressure to allow supermarkets to get into dispensing. Which is, I, you know, I presume he's really happy about that, right? No, no. He's, he's, oh, well, from a, I guess from a competition point of view, it is a distortion in the market that you, you know, <laughs> supermarkets are not allowed to do something. I think this is a really interesting one. I, was, I saw some of your tweets last night, Stephen, on this, and I don't quite get what 
the, I don't quite get what the competition issue is. It seems to me that Chemist Warehouse has forced competition into a protected industry, the pharmacy sector, forced down prices and delivered a better deal for consumers. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if it was extended to the supermarkets? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's better just, prices, it's, better it's service. Same as the news agents, and it's just the age-old argument yeah. that pharmacists are pillars of the community. Yep. They are sort of quasi-doctors in white coats. They look after you, and their livelihood should not be destroyed. Destroyed with the Walmart effect of just some huge category killer coming in and smashing the lot. It's it's as simple. Yeah. It's as simple as protecting a powerful profession. What yeah. about the? Uh, That's what a valid argument. What about the problem that? chemist warehouse is now becoming a wholesaler to other chemists yeah i think that there's a there is a competition don't they issue have there. to don't they have to um divest the wholesale business uh, well they're, they're buying a giant wholesaler this is where i think i actually suspect the deal i i think the deal may not complete i just think there's so many different possible things that can go wrong and the ACCC is the biggest one. Is they, the ACCC may come in and say sell 100 pharmacies or ring fence your wholesale to a certain degree because their secret source is now public and there will be some powerful forces against it. When you suddenly come out and say, hey, look at us, we're suddenly worth $8 billion, it's yeah. like, where'd that come from? You know, when there are regulatory rules about you can only own five pharmacies in a single state. Um, so I think that, that Chemist Warehouse would not be allowed just to come in and buy Sigma. If they just said, oh, we're, we're taking over Sigma, we're becoming vertically integrated, I reckon the ACCC would say, hang on a minute, but by announcing this as a backdoor listing, Sigma raising $400 million, this whole sort of sense of inevitability, everyone going, wow, with the business and the data, I think they're just hoping to push the envelope, as they've done in their entire business model for 20 years, push the envelope and hope the regulators sort of let them get away with it. Another interesting aspect of the deal before we move on to other subjects is that it seems to have been the idea of David DePillar, who was the UBS investment banker, who uh, went into his own business, bought the master's sites, sites yep. off Woolworths, ended up with a company called HMC, which owned 20% of, uh, Sigma. of yep. Sigma, and he happens to be Mario Verrocchi's cousin. Yeah. And his sister's going on the board. And, and, she's, a, and, she, and she's a franchisee. She's well, uh, so she works. She works in the business. She started off as a franchisee. A year, she's a thirty-year franchisee. Yeah, she's an absolute pillar of the. So joint. this is part of the family and friends model in yeah. terms of who so are your franchisees. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, De, De Pillar's an incredible deal. You look at what he's done in the last few years. Yeah, yeah, he's amazing. He, he's, he's a force of nature. It is an interesting so. question, in my view, though, as to whether he should be allowed to vote that twenty percent stake, uh, because if the Sigma share price tanks. Tomorrow, when they come back on after raising four four hundred million at seventy cents, yep. and they say, "Geez, it's a bit rough here to only get fourteen percent of the company, and you've got to pay seven hundred million dollars in cash to these billionaires, and the stock falls to fifty cents," then ordinarily the shareholders would say, "Vote against this; it's a done deal." But the pillar's sitting there with twenty percent. And he's allowed to vote at the moment is the current situation, whereas Chemist Warehouse is not allowed to vote its 0.7% stake in Sigma. So I think that's a really interesting connection. I think connection. Sigma shareholders will be pretty pragmatic. They will realise that uh, the Sigma wholesale business um, essentially has been valued at zero by this deal because the only relationship that matters is the chemist warehouse one. Take that away, you got nothing. If I was a Sigma shareholder, I'd be going, this has exposed this business as Well, that's where pretty chemi limited. Chemist Warehouse has the foot on the throat because yeah, it, they ditched a Sigma a few years ago and Sigma's share price cratered. They went off to EBOS and now they've done, ditched EBOS, the Kiwi giant, worth $6 billion, and they've gone back to Sigma. Yep. And then, so you're right. So, so Chemist Warehouse commercial dealings with Sigma – uh, the company making or company breaking arrangement because they're the giant gorilla of the of the empire of the industry. I think the other thing for Sigma shareholders is, <clears throat> based on fundies that I spoke to yesterday, everyone will want to be in this thing at some stage. Sigma shareholders are actually going to be in at the ground floor. I, I can't see. It. I can't. I think this deal gets done. I can't see Sigma shareholders being an issue, but maybe there's a few who raise a few concerns. What about? Um Moving on, what about Woodside Santos? Is that going to go ahead? I don't think oh, – I'm not sure. I, I think Woodside's not trying one on, but but is taking the uh, very US view that you can get away with offer, offering us a, a, a low or 
zero premium in the hope that everybody sees, everybody in the oil and gas sector sees the bright future for oil and gas or, or you know, at least a very profitable future for the next 10 or 15 years. But the Santos shareholder base is frustrated. They are angry at, at the underperformance and they want, they, they want the sugar hit. They, they want something now. They don't want to wait five or ten years sitting in Woodside shares because it's an all-script deal uh, as it's proposed. So I think this has got a lot to run. I think it's more likely that someone comes and bids, someone else comes and bids for all or part of Santos. And cash. Possibly. Yeah. And there's some seriously cashed up energy giants around the world. And is Santos, is Santos desirable for those, for those companies? It's, it's Papua New Guinea and assets are really desirable. Yep. So there's parts of Santos that people will be nervous about, but there's parts that a Total or a BP or a Conoco Phillips would love. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think that the South Australian government is also an interesting player yeah. here because, I mean, when Alan Bond tried to buy Santos in 1979 and he got to 40%, they just came in and legislated and said no one can own more than 15%. So Bondi had to sell 15% to Rupert Murdoch, 15% to Peter Abels, and uh, Santos was liberated and remained independent. So... I don't think you're going to see the Santos head office become a branch office of Perth-based Woodside. I just don't think the South Australian government will sign over the tenements for the Cooper Basin unless they get a sweet parochial deal for South Australia, given it's been so hollowed out yeah, as a corporate centre with the loss of Normandy Mining, BRL Hardy, Folding, Bank of Adelaide. I mean, Oz you minerals. name it, they've lost Oz Minerals. You name it, they've lost them. Santos is the last corporate standing almost in Adelaide. Um, you know, even the Hills Hoist Company has sort of pretty much gone broke, you know, in the last uh, in the last year or so. So, yeah, so I, I think the regulatory issues are too difficult from a parochial South Australian government point of view. So why does why does Woodside want to do it? Just just as an opportunistic thing. Yeah, I think size is becoming really important. You need a really big balance sheet to compete with other big giants, but also fund decarbonisation. You need really – it's going to be really expensive. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. And I get the idea of having a, a Australian-based independent, not you know, not a subsidiary of Woodside or B, sort of Shell or BP or someone or Chevron as we've always been or Exxon, but it's 30 years too late. I mean, no one wants to be a top 10 player in oil and gas anymore with the whole sort of climate debate. Yeah. Uh, this needed to happen. 30 yeah. years ago, uh, and now it's sort of a, the dinosaurs are all getting together. Exxon and Chevron have just done massive acquisitions and Woodside's sort of saying, we've got to get big or get out type yeah. thing. That can be very profitable, though. The dinosaurs can have a – like the tobacco big industry. Big tobacco, the big two. That, they it just tells us you can fortune, have a, a yeah. big last I re- I read couple this, of decades. I read this morning that the, they're not going to have a phase out of fossil fuels coming out of COP28 in, uh, in Dubai. It's going to be – Reduce fossil right. fuels. It's looking pretty weak, it's isn't looking, it, the language? Yeah, you know, I mean, and apparently I read that Chris Bowen is thumping the table and saying this is unacceptable, uh, which is interesting because he's the minister of a very large fossil fuel exporter. Yes. <laughs> a petro state in the view of some. A petro state. Well, yes. certainly a, a fossil fuel state with you, you include coal. coal so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think. And Twiggy's there in Dubai on his boat, Green Pioneer, yeah. hosting John Kerry. So, uh, yeah, but oh, no, it's, right. it is looking pretty thin in terms of the actual language coming out of this one. So, uh, and, and, you know, the bloke who runs it, what's his name? Uh, Sultan Al Jabbar. Jal Jabbar. <laughs> I mean, did I say that correctly? No. Um, he was talking about the way, of course, we want to phase out. This was earlier. He had a mm. press conference. Uh, denying that he was weak on the subject and said, you know, it's all just gone to water. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway. And before we move on to just our review of the year, what do we think of the migration strategy that was announced uh, yesterday by Claire O'Neill? Well, you're the quarterly SA housing man. What do you think about it? Oh, I think it's pretty weak, really. I mean, they, she says that they're, 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 redu- they're going back to... Uh, normal immigration levels of 250,000 a year, um, which is above normal. It's more than normal, really. I mean, it depends. It depends what you take as normal uh, and what time frame. But uh, 250,000 a year is pretty high, um, and it's going to require quite a lot of uh, housing, a lot more housing approvals than we're currently coming up with, in order to uh, not continue to tighten the housing market as a result of it. So, yeah. Uh I reckon, I reckon there's an. I reckon it's not this immigration debate, but the next one that's going to be interesting. And I think the next one is going to be aging population. The world is clamouring for 
what I would call doers, tradies, not the people who can design the wind turbine or finance it through an investment bank, but the people who can maintain it and build it. And, and, and we're going to be short doers. Yeah, yeah. And Listen, so I, this I, mean, I, I don't want this to sound about. like I'm against immigration. I know, yeah, I, no. I'm, I'm very much in favour of it. I think we need all that immigration. It's just the problem is housing them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't think there's enough, there's enough uh, focus on that. No, no. I've been disappointed with Dutton and Dan Teon in terms of the rhetoric. So I think the government's been pushed into this by politics because immigration is more potent globally than ever before at the moment. I um, mean, Rishi Sunak and Rwanda and uh, the Mexican border, you know, it is on for young and old, the rise of right-wing populists. So this is just trying to get ahead of the curve politically. Um, and I personally don't enjoy it. I think, you know, from a Melbourne point of view, we're one of the four great international student cities in the world, yep. you know, along with uh, Paris, London and New York. We've got 14, 15,000 students on the Parkfield campus of City of Melbourne, the most of any campus in the world. It makes Melbourne a beautifully vibrant and lively place. Totally agree. Place. And, but, but the problem is you can't get around Melbourne now. I yeah. mean, it's becoming impossible to, to, to get around, leaving aside the housing issues. Just the infrastructure, the transport infrastructure is woefully short yep. of, of the population requirement, it seems to me. Yeah. Um, okay, we so move on before we start sounding like old men uh, whinging about the traffic. <laughs> 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 All right, James, it was your idea for... Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, the awards. The awards, awards. of the year. So well, I think we did our awards last year and even some predictions, and I don't want to remember what they are, so I'm going to choose to forget them. <laughs> <laughs> no, we only look forward in journalism. Right, in okay, the prediction good, game, good. never look back. Oh, yeah, that's right. All right, exactly. so uh, th- three, three, three awards, biggest winner of the year, biggest loser of the year, and what's the big story for 2024? Stephen, do you want to go first with your winner? Yeah, I've already mentioned him. I'm going to go with Twiggy. Um, I know his marriage broke down and that sort of stuff, but... Andrew Forrest. Andrew Forrest, yeah. But look, he has spent $4 billion buying that renewables business, CWP. He's bought a Cobra. He's bought Mincor, the nickel miner, for $700 million. The iron ore price has just gone for, on a run from 100 a tonne in May up to 137 again. And as we speak today, uh, Fortescue is worth $79 billion and his stake is worth $26 billion. So he, he has gone mad on green and renewables and climate He's got this incredible global profile. He's spending billions on all these frolics and his core wealth and share price has just continues to go through the roof and he is just unstoppable. Alan? Uh, Oh, well, um, mine is a more global one. I was going to suggest that Sam Altman of OpenAI is a winner. Good, good. They fired him (laughs) and he's come back in triumph (laughs) to to run it. Literally like the second coming. (laughs) And I just think it's really interesting what's going on there because OpenAI remains a, a uh, not-for-profit charity. I mean, it is uh, a, a fascinating situation that it, and it isn't – I mean, yes, they've raised a lot of money, um, but, but they haven't done it through issuing equity. They've issued – what they've done is they've given Microsoft and other companies a right to – a capped right to future profits. Mm. And so it, it's still a charity, this thing, that's developing, supposedly, developing artificial intelligence for the good of humanity, um, while everyone else is, you know, busily developing it for the good of themselves and, their, you know, their shareholders and to make money. OpenAI remains that. And Sam Altman is back running it. Um, and it, uh, it's completely unclear as to what's going on with him. Is he? Yeah. It was it a was it a victory of the capitalists over the um, over the effective altruists, uh, altruists, which uh, you know. I mean, and the loser. I mean, if I may say, the loser in that was Helen Toner, who's the Australian mm. director mm. of OpenAI, who got ejected. Yeah. Um, who appears to be one of you know a member of the effective altruism group. Mm. Who uh, anyway? It's a bit confusing to yeah, be honest. It's fascinating. Though. Anyway, carry on. All right, my my winner. I'm going to go for a off Broadway winner. A uh, guy called Robin Cooder is the founder of a company called Air Trunk. Expect to hear a lot more about Air Trunk next year when I think they will float. But he pulled off the biggest debt deal in the country this year. Raised four point six billion dollars, 
Airtrunk is a data centre business that is growing like wildfire with artificial intelligence. 40 banks wanted to get in on this thing. That's how much demand there was. So I reckon Robin Coote is already on the rich list. Watch him next year. He'll be an even bigger winner, but a quiet big winner this year. The, the Melbourne Cup field of biggest losers. <laughs> there has never been an easier year for picking a biggest loser, but we'll let you go first, Stephen. Okay, well, I, I'm not going for an individual. I'm going to go for a corporate. So I'm going to go with Star Entertainment. Oh, good one. They have done two capital raisings. <laughs> They've raised, they first raised $800 million at $1.20. Then they raised $750 million at uh, 60 cents. And the stock today is 47 cents. So the investors have stumped up $1.55 billion and now holding stock worth $900 million. So they're down six. $150 million in nine months since the first raising in March. Unreal. And, I mean, I, I should add Blackstone to this, having paid effectively $10 billion for Crown or $13 a share. If the stock was trading today, it'd be five or six. So Blackstone, the world's biggest private equity firm, has dusted probably four, five, six billion dollars buying crowns. So the casinos franchise have been destroyed by all their scandals and the regulatory onslaught that they have suffered as a result. And anyone in the casino business still has been a massive loser this year. Good call. Alan? You can go next. No, you go. Oh, well, I'd say my biggest loser is Anthony Albanese. I think that oh. the the, vo the voice vote was an absolute debacle. Good one. Um, you know, and he's blown up his... Uh, uh, he's blown up his honeymoon vote. His uh, his political capital's gone out the window. It's a mess. I mean, fair dinkum. <laughs> I just think he's, um, you know, Come on, how he how the, he has kept a promise? He said how, he'd do it and he did it. Come on, and he's respected the decision. Yeah, okay, but I think he shouldn't have done it. Uh, it's a good loser. Yeah, I mean, I think he's. Uh, He's my biggest loser anyway. Fair enough. My big, I'm, I'm going to have a joint biggest loser, Qantas and PwC. Yeah. Uh, Qantas lost a chairman and a CEO. Uh, PwC lost an entire arm of their business yes. for a dollar. They had to sell their government services business for a dollar and this will reverberate through professional services for a decade. <laughs> yes. It is a stinker. And the lesson is watch out for the pile on. For the yeah. combined regulatory, political and media pylon, it can destroy you. Yeah, absolutely. It can destroy when you. The, they are when very the, potent when everyone is on board. When the story goes from the financial review to the mainstream media, it has a special And then kick. into parliamentary yeah. hearings yeah. Yeah, uh, right. and then ACCC court actions. Yeah. I mean, it can absolutely fly. Biggest so. story for 2024, Stephen. <laughs> So I think I'm going to go broad and, and say it's going to be a big year for elections. So you've got the UK, you've got the US, you've got Queensland, you've got uh, even you've got the city of Brisbane. And I think the whole issue of migration, right-wing populism, the whole geopolitics, I mean, in Argentina they've pivoted to a mad guy on the right. You had Maloney in Italy. If it just had the Dutch go for... Gert Wilders getting the biggest vote and he's on the, he's on the extreme right. So I think this whole issue coming down to whether we get Trump again is the core of it, but just this can internationalism survive, democracy under under threat, Middle East, you know, Ukraine, I just think the geopolitical instability and elections and democracy will be the dominant issue of next year. Good one. Alan? Uh, well, um, in March this year, China became the world's largest exporter of cars. And I, I think that um, one of the, the interesting themes of next year is going to be China's rise as a, a car com a car state and a car exporter, car producer. I mean, it's been a, it's been the world's largest producer of cars for a long time, um, but it's now just yeah. swamping the world with, with EVs. With, with EV, well, uh, and any sort of cars, but yeah. principally EVs. It's the dominant. Um, I mean, it is it is the world's renewable superpower in terms of producing solar uh, solar panels. Everything to do with renewable energy. It's got the entire um, supply chain of renewable energy, uh, batteries, cars sewn up. Uh, I just think China has played this incredibly well. Um, you know, I mean, ever, we've spent the year talking about how China's economy is collapsing because of the real estate crisis, which it had, the real estate crisis, every bit as big as the America's cri uh, cri uh, real estate crisis in 2007. Yeah. Um, but it has not collapsed. The, they've not gone into recession. It's because the China's um, 
uh, China's trade surplus has tripled in two or three years. Mm. I mean, it's... But you don't think the likes of, you know, Apple and Musk, Tesla have sort of captured a lot of that upside with uh, all their sort of China interests? An increasing and number of Teslas are made in China. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they're just, uh, the, sure, but China's, China's got it, everything. China's got it. Yeah, man, good, good one. My, my big story is interest rates. I know we've been talking about interest rates for two years, but this is the year where we will finally see the pain that the most rapid tightening cycles in 40 years actually delivers. We're getting a little sense of it towards the end of the year, but f- imagine how tough this is going to be uh, t- this time next year if we haven't had any rate cuts, which I think is a is is a possibility. Uh, the setup for the for the federal election in 2025 by this time next year it'll be an intensely. A tough period for the economy and an intensely tough period for both sides of politics. All right, good one. That's a good I, one. I've stolen the um, hosting duties there, so Alan, no, I'm going to go back to you. Well, we've got questions now. We'll start with Bart. Uh, before we do that, we need to get to a quick word from our sponsor. InvestSmart's professionally managed accounts is a digital wealth platform with diversified investment portfolios overseen by Australia's most trusted finance experts, including Paul Clitheroe, Effie Zahos, and the Money Cafe's Alan Kohler. Join thousands of Australians growing their wealth through InvestSmart's managed portfolios. Check out investsmart.com.au for more information. Okay. Go, Stephen. All right. Well, Bart is asking us to get the crystal ball out on seven metrics, and we could be here for two hours <laughs> if we went through all of them. But good, let's good very, idea. very quickly skirt around the table. So the ASX 200, next 12 months, up or down, guys? Down. Do I'm, I'm a down two from 7,200 at the moment. Yeah, I think sideways. But, you know, it depends on hard or soft landing in the US, really. It I mean, depends. if it's up, yeah, it can't it, say it depends. Yeah. And uh, we've got to keep this moving. Interest rates, I say no more rises, but no falls either. I just think they're going to be steady for the year. Oh, right. yeah, I think so. Me too. On hold till 2025. CPI, yeah. I think it'll be back within the 2 to 3% range within 12 months. No. Uh, three and a half to four for me. Yeah, I think so too. Above three, but on the way down to, yeah. to three. GDP, no recession, but fairly insipid two, growth. Two percent growth. Yep, sounds yep. about right. Property prices, I think, with immigration coming off, we'll see a five percent drop in residential. Five percent rise. There's still so many, so much demand for so few houses. Correct. That's right. I agree. I think house prices are going to continue and to he rise. He literally wrote the book. He did. He did. And oil prices, I think they'll be going. They won't stay at this level at seventy-one twenty-five a barrel. I think they'll be edging back up. Yeah, I think so too. Um, but unless, the, yeah, oil price is a thing to watch. If if oil breaks below seventy bucks, that is the commodity market telling us there's something bad coming. Yeah, really bad. Correct. That's recession stuff. Yeah, that's true. And I just suggested we want to throw in another metric of our own. I'm going to say uh, iron ore. That the federal government, after seven years of saying that the <laughs> the iron ore price will be average of US fifty five dollars a ton, I think they'll finally drop that because at the moment it's at one hundred and thirty seven fifty, totally underpinning Australia's budgetary power and economic performance as usual. So I just well, I reckon a year ago fifty five looked looked probable. Uh, I mean, you know... In, I, I wrote a column on this week. It's the greatest mystery of... of well, I think, it gets, I, I think it's gone up because of uh, China's ca- success with cars. It has. You, yeah, you yeah. Re- go and read my column, Alan. It's a great... It's a, it is the, exactly that. Property is 35% of steel demand. The other 65% has gone okay. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not great, but it's okay. Well, yeah. you know, yeah, the, the cars, uh, cars are mostly uh, uh, batteries these days. <laughs> I mean, uh, both the cost and the weight, yes, but it's, they're still wrapped in steel. Yeah, yeah. Now, our first question we'll do with is Bart and Jaden combined. Is the work from home phenomenon and or everyone being on their iPhones and the whole social media thing, is that a driver of the fact that we've got this decreasing labour productivity uh, across the economy? What do you think? Oh, I reckon, sorry. You go. go uh, uh, I reckon that's a factor. I think working from home is a drain or uh, t- does tend to reduce productivity. Uh, I think well, iPhones probably do too. But I think the main thing is the shift in the economy towards services, which are inherently less productive. 
Yeah, and Jaden says that his personal productivity is down 20% when he's in the office. I reckon, Jaden, you're going to be in the office more and more. I, I, I think this is this is an amazing thing. We're, we had a lunch the other day with a big bank CEO and I said to him, you know, he's sort of like, oh, well, it's okay now. We're, we're relatively happy. People are in two and a bit days a week. And I said, to, and I said, you know, five years ago, would if I'd told you your workforce is going to be in the office two and a bit days a week and you'd be okay with it, you would throw me out of this office. <laughs> it is amazing the change in people's perceptions it and is. I reckon it might start to shift back. Yeah. Well, I'm celebrating 20, 25 years of working from home oh, next year yeah. and uh, I'm not going to have anyone tell me I can't sit on Twitter all day on my phone and uh, tweet away about what's happening <laughs> at some online AGM somewhere Noted. in Australia. Noted. Mason, I, this is for you, Alan. I'll read it out. I recall okay. a while back, perhaps in the early stages of the pandemic spending, Alan was talking about Milton Friedman, Friedman, who said, quote, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. He was later quoted as saying that this refers to persistent inflation, not to short-term shocks. Is he still right or has the pandemic and countries like Japan proven otherwise? Oh, well, I, I think when I quoted that, I was saying that uh, <laughs> Milton Friedman was wrong, that inflation is clearly not always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. I mean, I think it's obviously the case. I mean, it's it's often a monetary phenomenon, but not always and everywhere. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, uh, isn't, that, isn't that fair enough? What yep. will happen when, when that $220 billion of printed money gets handed back by the banks to the Reserve Bank on June 30 next year? That will be a massive reduction removal of monetary what stimulus. Are you, what are you talking about? That's the term funding finance, the TFF for COVID stimulus, where the Reserve Bank printed all this money and gave it to the banks, three-year term at 0.1%, massive subsidy and liquidity boost to our banks. That's got to all be handed back on June 30 next year. That's already been refinanced, most of it. Well, it's just... At, at higher costs, but yeah, yeah. They'll, sure. they'll be right. Don't they won't right be handing much. anything back. They're ready for it. <laughs> They're right. ready for it. Uh, Okay, Luke says, why when a company announces a capital raising, why does it why does the share price drop when the amount they've raised when they're raising the funds at? Below the amount they've raised the funds at. Why wouldn't an investor just buy on the market? Go. Well, this has been a very interesting year for bad capital raisings. Uh, where a capital raising has been announced and the stock price has tanked and it's traded below the offer price. And the bottom line is it's it's supply and demand. So when you're issuing lots of new shares, people you know don't want to hang on to what they've got or they've got indigestion from having to buy so many. But the other thing is there's been so many bad deals this year where companies have overpriced. So Aurora... Aurora, Over, overpaid yep. two point something billion for a French glass maker. Treasury Wine Estates blowing one point six billion on a Californian wine operation. Even Evolution Mining last week paid seven twenty million for an eighty percent stake in a mine, the North Parks Copper Gold Mine near Parks. Its shares have plunged after the five twenty five million dollar placement, and they're trading at a discount of twenty cents to the offer price. So, I just say that it's been a, a year of dud deals. You know, even Lion Town Resources did a three sixty five million dollar placement at dollar eighty. Stocks now at a dollar thirty three. Gina Reinhardt's down six hundred million on the one point two billion she spent. <laughs> so I think it's just, and this is where, this is where Chemist Warehouse might be interesting. Is this another dud deal, dud capital raising by Sigma? We will see tomorrow when the <laughs> stock comes back on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's supply and demand. There is a general. Distrust, or maybe distrust is scepticism amongst fund managers about the deals that companies do, particularly when it involves going offshore. I mean, Stephen didn't mention the big deal that didn't get up, which was EBOS buying a, a big pet retailer. That one would have had a $3.5 billion capital raising attached to it. It didn't even get to the starting line because it couldn't, there was no interest. So, Oh, fundies are interesting in this country. They are all bleeding about, you know, we want new things to invest in. And then when they get the new thing to invest in, often yeah, it doesn't work out. Been, it has so been a bad duds. year. APM, what a dud float yeah, that was. You, Latitude, you, you got so rem- many You've got to remember that we, there's also been some fantastic capital raisings in previous years. Like Cochlear raised during the, the start of the pandemic – You'd be so far in front on your, your no, money No, but they there. scaled retail back and yeah. gave it all to the fundies. Well, you're always going to find something to <laughs> win you yeah, out. Yeah, but. that's right. <laughs> well, okay, let's, yeah. let's be positive. The best capital raisings this year were Steadfast, Flight Centre and the Grey Mining. They have all raised capital and the stock has gone up. But, but that's been the minority situation. 
All right. Okay. Alex asks, do you think the reduction in productivity per capita over the last 40 years has a correlation, perhaps casual relationship? Causal. Causal, causal sorry. <laughs> causal relationship to investment property. I've been told land and housing has come at the expense to investment opportunities in Aussie businesses. <sighs> well, with a, I agree with a massive property bubble. It is quite distorting. You get people looking at a business like Harvey Norman and saying, well, you know, it's actually just worth its property holdings, uh, not the retail business. And same with Brickworks. Everyone says it's not a brick-making company, it's a property development company because yeah. property is so valuable. So I, I, I do agree that it sometimes distorts, but it's a good problem to have because it's a massive store of wealth. My mate, Jerry Bidak, is uh, often produces a graph, uh, graphs showing... Uh, rising corporate profits and declining business investment yep. at yeah, the same time. Correct. Business investment has declined uh, a lot um, and that's another big reason for the decline in productivity because businesses just aren't investing enough uh, at the same time as their profits are rising. Yeah, but that's got nothing to do with property. I mean, most of those businesses sold and leased back their property a decade ago. Oh, yeah. I'm so not talking, I, I, no, well, no, I guess I, what I'm agreeing with you that there's a separation here. It's not all yeah. about property. Oh, no, that's but, right. But most of the wealth is in property. Like the chemist warehouse founders, they leased properties to the chemist warehouse business for $32 million last year. So yeah. not only do they own a massively valuable business, they've, they're a landlord on top of that with much of the properties that they run the business from. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> that's, that's good work if you can get it. Oh, uh, Jesus. <laughs> Your turn. So Your Alex, turn, Steve. Uh, Alex says, uh, I don't know, so no, Paul, Paul says, you were discussing a few weeks ago the difficulty for active fund managers to outperform the market as they grew in size. Do you see this being the same issue for super funds? I think Australian super gets $2 billion in net inflows per month. Month. I think it would be difficult to find investments with good returns for all this money. Thanks for the excellent show and have a great Christmas. This is an issue, uh, definitely, and the super funds are thinking about this all the time. Uh, that's why – and the the reason you see them go into unlisted assets is because they're trying to avoid the problem that fund managers have got. Uh, they they, they want to steer away from equities, get into unlisted things where valuations are a bit smoother and there's opportunity for alpha. But – there's a great bit of research by a guy in the US. He looked at the big Californian uh, state pension, CalPERS, and he went back over 40 years of returns and compared it to an ETF with a little bit of gearing. What do you reckon happened? The ETF outperformed. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And the reason... Over 40 years. Scoreboard, uh, guys. Well, Scoreboard. Uh, well, I uh, mean, the reason for that is simply the, the big tech companies, the seven big yeah. tech companies yeah. have dominated the market over the past five years, if, if not longer. And all you had to do was buy the, buy the market but it, and you won. Uh, but it's interesting, isn't it? All the work that super funds and pension funds do on asset allocation, all the time and effort and huge teams, could have just bought ETFs. Yeah. It's a bit, a of, a, of, a bit of a lesson a for all of, over, of us. That was, a lot of overpaid and overcharging yeah. fund managers out there. I think yeah. that's certainly, that's truer in the US because of the big tech companies than it is here. Sure, but sure. It's, but this, it's the, the, true this, this was a, a, a global asset allocation ETF portfolio. Matt, Matt says, why does anyone short shares directly when you can instead buy a put option and cap, cap a put option and cap your risk? I appreciate you have to pay an option premium, but it seems fair enough considering typically. Typical shorting involves an infinite downside if the market moves against you. Look, I think it's just a supply and demand thing. Is that for some reason the investment banks and the long fund managers who have stock to lend have come up with a system where there's material amounts of available stock to short and the financial system just has not come up with such, such volumes of put options to take equivalent exposures for the same price. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a volume thing too. I, I don't know how many, how much... It might work for Matt as a retail investor to buy some options. I'm yeah. not sure whether he'd be able to get the ten percent of the company, exactly. like you see with the big the, short positions. The, yeah, because yeah. yeah. so. the big index funds have got typically fifteen percent of uh, of every company, yeah. and they often just they get a, vex a margin by lending it out. They don't care because right. they're long holders. Yeah. And, uh, all right, so Big Bank Deep Trade says to Alan, thoroughly enjoyed making my way through your quarterly essay. I work in mortgages for one of the big four. There used to be a heavy focus on how much market share you could gain, but this year our banks have been keeping pricing higher to avoid market share growth because the margins aren't as lucrative, particularly with 70% of mortgages coming via mortgage brokers. Is there an argument to be made that this is anti-competitive behaviour, says Deep Throat? And should banks be obligated to pass rate cuts on in full when we eventually find ourselves back in a rate-cutting environment? Alan. Oh, well, you know, I mean, the, 
the, the banks, it is a cartel, of course, and the banks, it is, uh, it is not competitive uh, in that respect. But look, uh, no one's going to force them to do anything, really. I'm surprised at uh, Big Bank Deep Throat because the numbers say it has been very competitive. Mm. Uh, ANZ NAB has been going for it. No, no, no the, the ones who have been going for it are ANZ and Westpac. Uh, ANZ suffered what Matt Common, the, C- the Commonwealth Bank CEO, said was the biggest margin erosion in Australian banking history mm. in the last six months of its financial year uh, because it was going because it's been competing aggressively on mortgages. So well, I'm not sure. I think it is really competitive. Macquarie. ANZ and Westpac are going pretty hard. CBA and NAB have been more intent on uh, pulling back from aggressive pricing you, and maintaining you've, you've market You've got an insider here saying the opposite. Yeah, well, there you go. He, uh, he, he, uh, he's the, he's, he's in, he or she probably works for one bank. Um, I, I don't know. I, Maybe he works for Commonwealth. I, I, think, I think it's pretty competitive. Out. If you, tr- yeah. you go and try and get a loan, yeah. Go to a mortgage broker and get a loan. They're, they're falling over. Yeah. Well, so at, at Manningham, we've we've got more money on deposit with NAB than CBA at the oh. moment, 29 versus 27 million, because they've been so aggressive on the deposit front. So uh, I must admit, if there's one law you could change mm. in terms of the bank power, because Deep Throat's also saying, could you change a law on um, on you know, to make it make it fairer? I reckon this idea that you have to effectively give a personal guarantee with a, a mortgage. Uh, I'd, I, it should be non-recourse in my view. You shouldn't have to effectively give a personal guarantee when you take out a loan. Um, and I also reckon that you should have to pass on Reserve Bank rate cuts in full. Like this whole thing that the banks control pricing when the government sets pricing, I think it's, there should be a, a bit more of a follow through to, uh, I, I know it's price controls and you'd argue against that. Oh, well, they control one element of pricing. The banks have to go offshore to get their funding. They have to, you know, if you can get more deposit funding, you can offer better rates. But that's why this is a cartel, because everyone's just got their money on deposit sitting there earning not much, and then Judo Bank tries to come along and compete, and their pricing in the wholesale market is huge because they just haven't got the credit rating and the, the, the market pricing power of the big four who can borrow money cheaply offshore. It, it, it is funny to me... You know, I don't, not, I don't want to be seen to be defending the banks, but if you said, what's the, what's the ideal number of competitors in supermarket industry? It's not two. Is it four? Well, that's what we've got in banks, and everyone thinks it's a cartel, a disastrous <laughs> cartel. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's, actually, <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually quite competitive, no, which, right. which oh, makes okay. their it's market power and profits so surprising, but it's basically the but size also, of the mortgage market. Uh, yeah, so I huge. suppose the other thing that makes it uh, should make it more competitive is the way that so many mortgages now, more than half, certainly more than half, oh, yeah, are uh, uh, done by mortgage, oh, uh, I mortgage the, brokers. The real story in mortgages is that the banks have lost control of this sector and they've, it's all become commoditised and they'll pay for it for years to come. But yeah. the volume has just gone up and up and up and up. Over three trillion, and yeah, well, at the end of the day, you're clipping the ticket still. Yeah, that's you know, right. Uh, volume game. They've got their costs down. Technology closing branches. The volume's about to come down though, because there's been a volume spurt because of all this refinancing activity. The fixed loans going to variable. That's about to end. It's, yeah. it's six months away from ending. So yeah. let's see in six months. Please keep writing to us, Big Bank Deep Throat. Um, your turn, James. Matthew says, love the podcast and enjoyed Alan's quarterly essay. In the past 10 years, I've been a homeowner, property investor and tenant, so I've seen it from all sides. If investors weren't able to break leases and evict, inv- evict tenants to sell, but instead sell the residents with whatever lease is in place, would this change the game? That's what happens with commercial leases. Would it lower prices and investor demand by increasing institutional... Sorry increasing investor risk in a lopsided system. Can Alan recommend some other big legal changes that would change the system for the better? That's a very interesting question, I reckon. Um, and I, I think there's something in that. Uh, I mean, obviously, te- you can't make it so the tenants are there forever or something. But you could say that if someone's on a, a 12-month lease, then that's it. And, and if you're going to sell your property halfway through the, the 12-month yeah. lease then the tenant's got six months to run and that's what you're selling. We can't buy Westfield Doncaster and have that transaction terminate all leases. No. It is quite outrageous, isn't it? That it you is. You just terminate a residential yeah. lease when you sell. Yeah, I know. It's, I mean, it, and it's just another, I suppose, another indication that the balance of power between tenants and landlords is skewed too much towards landlords. Yeah, it's got to be at the margins though, doesn't it? I think it's a, at the margins issue. I don't know. 
Oh, All right. Well, yeah. What, but what, what, no, but no, but the thing is, I suppose residents, residential leases are never the same length as, well, too as short. retail yeah. leases. It should be forced to be at least two years. One year. Yeah. It's just unfair. But on the, the retail a shop lease is like ten years or something, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, they can be really long. Yeah, they can be. Yeah. yeah. Now, last question from Mason. Hi, Alan, Stephen, and James. Is it true to say you're all journalists first and economists, finance experts second? I'm curious if you could talk to how you came into finance journalism. Did you want to start out in finance and fall into journalism or the other way around? We'd love to hear any interesting fork in the road moments from your careers. Love the pod. I use it to drown out the crappy music at the gym. Righto, Alan, your big fork in the road moment. It was boat building in Perth, wasn't it? When you? Well, oh, no. Well, I, I, uh, I tried. I, I applied for a cadetship at the Herald, as it was, in um, Crikey, when was it? Nineteen seventy. No, I'm not sure. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nineteen seventy. Uh, applied for. A, didn't get the cadetship at the Herald. Uh, ended up. Uh, I'd moved out of home, so I had to get a job. I ended up selling uh, steel pipes for Stuarts and Lloyds in City Road. Got a job as a, a trainee salesman for Stuarts and Lloyds as I waited to see for an opportunity to be a journalist. Right. Uh, finally, an ad appeared for a copy boys job at The Australian. Uh, applied for that. Got it. And it happened to be in the finance section. And so... Uh, Brian Friss was the finance editor in Melbourne, um, and there was Bob Mills, John Beaver, uh, f- two others. So it was a big finance section at the Australian. Mm. There, was, there were six journos, and I joined them as the copy boy, making coffee, doing the filing, doing their dry cleaning. <laughs> 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 and for 12 months I did that. That's great. 12 months I did that. Foot in the door. Uh, foot in the door, got a cadet ship. And my entire cadetship, the rest is history. Well, my entire cadetship, which is three years, was spent at the stock exchange in Collins Street in the press gallery overlooking yeah. the uh, chalkies. I did a year in that the, room too on the yeah. uh, on the floor of the stock exchange. So that's what I did every day was go there for three years and watch the stock exchange. Yeah, yeah. that was my cadetship. Fascinating, James. Uh, I um, always wanted to be a journalist, and then I did an internship at. In my last year at uni at the Oz in Melbourne, the section that needed help was the business section, and so I got a few things in the paper. I even did a story on the the uh, the Billabong float. I remember the na- the day the Billabong float was announced. I did a, a story on that with the help of someone else, of course. And so then a job came up at BRW as a as a trainee a, or cadet, as as a they were known then. And I actually had something in my portfolio that related broadly to business and I was away. But I've never regretted, like, you know, lots of people want to do different things in journalism, but I've always found the good thing about business journalism, you can write about sports or music or whatever it is. Everything's got a business element to it and uh, it's just been such a good career. Well, I think we clearly need to toast 92-year-old Chairman Emeritus Rupert Murdoch (laughs) because all three of us got our start from his Melbourne-based empire because my first job, I was cadet number 29 in the largest intake in the history of journalism when they took 29 cadets (laughs) in 1989. Rupert did in Melbourne at the the Sun News Pictorial and the Herald. They were still separate papers. So I was number 29, the only one who was sent off into the finance department because I'd done first year commerce at Melbourne Uni. And that was it. And then uh, got a job as a spin doctor for Jeff Kennett and then fork in the road, stupidly tried to blow him up by going on four corners and running against him. And so I was unemployable and I had to go off and start crikey and be a shareholder activist because couldn't work in the mainstream until Alan gave me a job. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> fork in the road. But here's to, here's to Rupert for giving us all our start in Melbourne. Before well, 1990, right. so he's he's done something the great, the great good. Man. He's done something good in he's his life. He's got no Rupert. regrets about that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, very good. Well, that's great. That's it. It's what it's been a fantastic year in the Money Cafe with you guys. Thank you very much for showing up each week or each fortnight. In your case, it's been it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, um, Alan. And can we just uh, pay tribute to our super producer, Greg? who um, is the silent uh, force, the glue, I reckon, Alan, that holds this podcast together. He is indeed. On, on behalf of uh, – we've got a little a gift for you here, Greg, from the three of us. Uh, 
We really, we really appreciate your uh, brilliant work on this podcast, Greg, and keeping us all in line. And I want to back that up because every other big podcast in America, you listen and I read out the credits and like 10 people get mentioned. Yeah. Sound engineers and composers and editors. And we've just got one person who does everything mm. and we don't even thank him every week. So I agree, a heartfelt thanks to Greg Dimopoulos. Good on you, Greg. Good on you, Greg. Producer thank extraordinaire. You. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. See you next year, everyone. Uh, oh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm James Thompson, Senior Shot to Clear columnist at the Australian Financial Review. Oh, yes. Well, I, I should say who I am. He's Alan and I'm Stephen and we'll see you next year. <laughs> see you next year. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha